Okay, this is Mac 1105, section 1 1.4. We're going to be looking at various properties having to do with complex numbers, specifically addition and subtraction of complex numbers, as well as multiplication and division. And then we'll also be looking at different operations we can perform with square roots of negative numbers. Okay, just a refresher on the definitions concerning imaginary numbers. And I just wanted to point out that these definitions evolved from equations like this, where mathematicians were trying to find solutions for an equation such as this, a number squared. What number squared is equal to negative one? And it was found that there are are no solutions for such an equation, not in the real number system anyway, because what number could you possibly square that would be equal to a negative? There is no such number. So since no, since no such number exists within the real number system, a new number system was created, and that's called the imaginary number system, which begins with the basic definition of what the number i is. This is the base unit, imaginary unit called i, and it is defined, as you probably well know, as the square root of negative one. So this is an imaginary number, whereas i squared is a real number. i squared is just real number, negative one, this is the imaginary unit. So let's begin with the type of problems that you're gonna be looking at in this section. First, um, simplifying numbers that have um, to do with imaginary units. Um, when you go to rewrite these, you know, just so that you see that um, as you simplify these, that this is part of it, not that you have to rewrite them like this each time, but square root of negative 81, for instance, can be rewritten as square root of negative 1 times square root of 81. It can be separated into those two parts making up a complete product of square root of negative 81. This portion right here is actually the definition of i. Then times square root of 81, we know to be 9, which of course the 9 would be written first as the coefficient and the i would be written in the back. Now, as long as you know that this is part of this, you don't have to rewrite it like this. So you're being asked to simplify these. It is simplified. And then you're also being asked to make a decision as to whether the number is imaginary or real. This number is imaginary. Moving to the next example, this number happens to be real because i squared is defined as negative 1. So this actually says negative 12 times i squared, which is the real number negative 1. So when you multiply these two, you get the real number 12. So this is actually a real number. Square root of negative 20, again, if you need to rewrite it, um, you can rewrite it or just recognize that whenever you have a negative underneath the square root, you're going to get an i. If you want to rewrite it, you can rewrite it as square root of negative 1 times square root of 20. This would be your i portion. This can be broken down, not completely, because you, this is not a perfect square. So you're going to be able to take out part of it, but not the whole thing. This can be broken down as 4 times 5. So both of those numbers are occurring up underneath the square root. You can take the square root of this piece, which would be 2. Don't forget that you've already rewritten this as the number i. So all of those things um, come out of the square root of negative 20. So you have 2i that have come out from underneath the radical. You've taken care of that, which is where the 2 came from. And the 5, there is no square root for 5, so that would be written towards the end. The decision of whether this is real or imaginary, because it has the imaginary unit, the entire number is considered imaginary. Okay, operations having to do with complex numbers. We're going to be looking that on looking at that on the next page. All different kinds of things that you can be doing with it, starting with addition and subtraction. So here you see that you've been asked to combine two complex numbers through the operation of addition in this first example and then through subtraction in the next example. So basically all you're doing is you're combining the real portions together. So this would be 7 
added to, or negative seven added to negative two, and that's gonna give you negative nine. And then you're also combining the imaginary portions, which are five i and three i. Taking into consideration their signs, these are both positive. So there is your finished sum and it's written in standard form for a complex number where the real portion is written first followed by the imaginary portion. That's considered standard form. In this problem, you're gonna have one extra step and that's brought on by this subtraction sign. That subtraction sign will cause you to switch because it really means all of this times negative one. That just is the same thing as saying switch both of these signs because you're distributing the distributing this negative through the parentheses. So you're really going to be looking at positive 5 and positive 9i, which are going to be combined by the other numbers that you see in this complex number. Again, you want to combine the real number with the real number over here. Remember, you've switched to positive 5, so this is going to be negative 16 combined with positive 5 which those two put together will give you negative 11. So that's your real portion. The imaginary portion of your answer will be positive i combined with 9i to give you a total of 10i. <laughs> okay, next we're gonna be looking at how to find products. Here what you're doing is, and I'm going to do this both ways because there actually is um, a shortcut for finding this product. You're mul multiplying a binomial, two terms, times another binomial. It's just that these binomials happen to be conjugates of each other. If you don't remember what that is, it's both of the binomials are almost the same, except the imaginary term here is positive while the imaginary term here is negative. So when they have the first, the same first term, but the back terms have opposite signs, those are considered conjugates. And whether your binomials, your binomial conjugates concern imaginary numbers or whether they don't have imaginary numbers, as long as they're conjugates, you can use a shortcut for foiling. If you have, are not using the shortcuts yet, this would be the standard way for getting this multiplied to just foil. That would involve finding four different products. That's one of them, first times first. This is what foil means. Outer times outer. Inner times inner would be another product and your fourth product would be last times last. So you'd have to first find those four products. So negative three times negative three would be nine. Negative 3 times negative 2i would be positive 6i. Then following these upside down arrows to find the third and the fourth products, that would be another um, 6, but this one would be negative. So that would be negative 6i. And then that last product would be positive 2i times negative 2i, which would be negative 4i squared. Okay, then continuing with this, after finding the four products, you'd be expected to combine like terms. These terms in the middle cancel because one of them's positive 6i while the other one's negative 6i. That leaves you with 9 minus 4i squared. But i squared has a definition in and of itself, which is it is equivalent to negative 1. So you can put a negative 1 in its place bring down that negative 4 multiplier because this term says negative 4 times i squared. Drop down the 9. Continuing with that, you would have positive 9. Negative 4 times negative 1 would be positive 4, resulting finally in 13. If you're using the shortcut, again, this shortcut only applies to conjugates. That's two conjugate binomials. The front terms will match, but yet the back terms will have opposite signs. Those are conjugates. So the shortcuts, the shortcut for conjugates is square minus square. So that'll cut out finding all the four steps and, co and combining like terms. 
you, when you do square minus square, you could either be looking at the two terms in the front parenthesis or the two terms in the back parenthesis. You'll get the same answer either way. What this shortcut means, square minus square, is square the front term. You get positive 9. Anytime you square, you get a positive. So negative 3 times negative 3 is 9. Square the back term. Uh, there's two parts to this back term. you got to square the, the numeric you know, the coefficient as well as the i, so you would get 4i squared. Those are the two squares, and then put a minus in between them. Okay, if it simplifies further, which of course it does, in every answer that you get that involves an i squared, you need to replace i squared with its definition, which is negative 1. i squared is defined as negative 1. So here you would have 9 and then negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4, resulting in 13. So about three to four less steps when you do it this way. Try to recognize when you can use a conjugate. It will come in very handy in problems that have many more steps than this. Okay, moving to the next couple of problems. Now we're finding quotients. In other words, we're doing division with complex numbers. So when you have a complex number in your denominator, anything that has a real and an imaginary portion connected by either a plus or a minus sign, the only way to get rid of the radical that's in the bottom, because i is a radical, it's square root of negative 1, is to completely multiply by the conjugate. So the conjugate of 5 minus 4i is 5 plus 4i. You must switch the sign in front of the imaginary number, not the real number. Whatever you decide the conjugate is for the bottom that you're going to multiply by, you have to multiply by that same expression in the numerator. Okay, getting that work done. I'm going to distribute this one term, this 3i, to both the 5 as well as the 5i. So that would be 15i, and then 3i times 4i would be positive 12i squared. Okay, if I continue with that, that would be 15i on the top. This would be positive 12 replacing i squared with its definition. So the top ends up being 15i, positive 12 times negative 1 is negative 12. So that's as far as I can go with the top. I have an imaginary term, and I also have a um, real term. So I'll probably switch those around and put it in standard form when I get done working on the bottom. On the bottom, I'm going to go ahead and use that shortcut that I'm trying to get you to use whenever you're multiplying conjugates. If you feel you must foil and do all those extra steps, then do that. But you should really start trying to use the shortcuts if you're not already doing so. Okay, just look at one parenthesis or the other, not both. I'm going to look right here, and I'm going to square that first term, which is 25, and I'm going to square that back term. When you square the number portion, it will be... Uh, 16, and when you square the i, it's i squared, so 16i squared. And then put a minus in between those two squares. This is going to end up being 25 minus 16 times negative 1, or in other words, 25 plus 16, because negative times negative is positive. When you add these two numbers in the bottom, you get 41. Okay, in the end, you're going to want to write your numerator in standard form. In other, in other words, the real number first, then the imaginary portion. You can always split these up as well. You can write it as negative 12 over 41 plus... 15i over 41. Be careful that when you do split them up, if either one of these reduces, then you're going to want to reduce them. Um, they don't, so we'll just leave it like that. <clears throat> okay, in this um, problem, I'm trying to get rid of another complex number, which I'll have to finish in the next video. 
but I'll at least write the conjugate, which is 4 minus 3i. And you'd be multiplying by that on the bottom as well as the top.